The year is 1858. An inexperienced 19-year-old geologist is about to set out on the longest, deadliest and strangest journey of his life. He will be joining famed Scottish explorer David Livingstone on an expedition aiming to journey up the 1500 mile long Zambezi River in South East Africa, the fourth longest river in the continent. There will be disease, danger, conflict and ultimately tragedy. But this young man, so full of potential and whose life was cut so tragically short only to fade from popular memory has the legacy of being the first Englishman to set eyes on Mount Kilimanjaro. So, this is the story of Richard Thornton, Yorkshire's forgotten explorer. He was born in Cottingley in 1838 and educated at Bradford and Bingley. At an early age he developed an interest in insects, later studying geology at university and winning prizes for his research. He was recommended by one of his professors as a promising young geologist to the explorer David Livingstone, who was collecting together a party for his latest expedition. Livingstone was at that time a national celebrity, having made a number of journeys through South and Central Africa. In 1857, he was funded by the government to launch an expedition to the Zambezi. Now, Livingstone is a complicated figure. On the one hand, his journeys throughout Africa did open the door to later European occupation, but on the other, his prime motivation was not to take over the land. Rather, he genuinely believed that by establishing trade and missionary centres along the river, the slave trade, which was being performed by the Portuguese and Ottomans, would be eradicated. And so, compared to many of his contemporaries, who did often just want to gobble up land, Livingstone's motivations can be seen arguably as humanitarian, and regardless of the unintended consequences of his expeditions, I think he should be commended for his determined efforts. As he wrote in his journal in 1867, Slavery is a great evil wherever I have seen it. However, as we shall soon see, Livingstone, despite his personal qualities, wasn't easy to work with, was borderline incompetent as an expedition leader, and in many ways contributed to Thornton's early death. Like anything in history, people are far more complex than we often realise. And so, in early 1858, Richard Thornton, then aged just 19, and having his only prior work experience being in mines in the north of England, waved goodbye to his family and set off on the journey. The expedition was, in short, a disaster. Livingstone would spend five years attempting to travel the Zambezi. Progress was incredibly slow, and his wife Mary would die of malaria along the way. But most importantly, Livingstone's mismanagement of the expedition led to him firing many of the party members, and the doctor, John Kirk, wrote that I can come to no other conclusion than that Dr Livingstone is out of his mind and a most unsafe leader. It was quickly becoming something out of Heart of Darkness. Thornton, like many of the other party members, was often ill and spent weeks unable to do anything. And when he recovered because of his lack of experience and his young age, he was unable to perform his work to Livingstone's standard. As he wrote, Thornton evidently disinclined to geologise and has done next to nothing for the last three months. Gorges himself with the best of everything he can lay hands on. Thornton doing nothing, is inveterately lazy and wants good sense. Okay, so maybe Thornton was treating the whole thing more like a holiday than a work trip, and so I can certainly understand Livingston's frustration that he wasn't pulling his weight. However, in Thornton's defence, he was clearly out of his depth, in a very strange environment, and rather than support him and help him develop his skills, Livingston would often just leave him behind at base camp and take others with him. Eventually, Livingston had had enough of Thornton and fired him from the party in 1859, a year after the expedition started. But rather than just go home in embarrassment and defeat, Thornton decided to stay and prove himself. And so over the next few years, battling diseases and deadly animals, he would befriend Portuguese traders and make his own way up the Zambezi and Luangua rivers. 
His youthful inexperience and immaturity clearly dissipated as a result of his solo travels, as he became moulded into a skilled, independent and resilient young man. As he wrote in a letter to his brother in 1861, Being thrown on my own resources in an outlandish country, without a penny in my pocket, has done me a great deal of good. During the last three years I have learnt much by experience. It is at times both an expansive and a very disagreeable way of learning, but its teachings are truly practical and very thorough. In fact, that same year Livingston asked Thornton to rejoin his expedition, likely because of the maps and geological information he'd collected. Thornton refused. He continued journeying and came to German East Africa, where he joined up with an explorer with the most 19th century German name ever, Baron Karl Claus von der Decken. Together, they attempted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Thornton thus became, at this point, the first Englishman to set eyes on the mountain, and though they failed in their aim to reach the summit, they were able to settle a long-running debate. Many were doubtful that a mountain located so close to the equator could have snow and ice on it, but Thornton was able to prove that it did. In 1863, Livingston again invited Thornton to rejoin the party. This time he accepted, likely because he was running low on funds, but also, I'd like to think, because he wanted to prove to Livingston just how much he'd grown and what he'd achieved since they parted. But just like before, Livingston's party was struggling. It was 1863. Supplies were running low. Maybe born out of a desire to impress Livingston further, Thornton volunteered to travel 150 miles to buy supplies. This he managed, helped in large part by his friendly relations with the Portuguese, but when he returned, weary, he caught fever and dysentery. A few days later he died, aged just 25, and is buried in what is now Malawi. Livingston never publicly took responsibility for creating the circumstances which led to Thornton's death and it took a long time for his family to receive his belongings. The supreme tragedy of Thornton's life is that he was an incredibly hard-working, intelligent and passionate young man who was thrown into a situation for which he was tremendously unprepared and unsupported and yet, despite suffering significant setbacks, he was able to use those experiences as opportunities for growth, proving himself not just as a person but as a geologist and an explorer. As George Martelli wrote, Thornton had all the qualities necessary to success in the career he had chosen. Guts, intelligence, industry, independence of spirit, and but for his tragic death he might well have achieved eminence in the geological exploration of Africa. It was a defect of Livingston's leadership that he failed to bring out these qualities, although Thornton had already shown them in his excellent survey of the river Zambezi, and that they only emerged after he had escaped from the expedition and the baneful influence of Livingston's brother. So that's a story of Richard Thornton, Yorkshire's forgotten explorer. Thrilling, inspiring and tragic. It brings me great joy to know that I can share these stories with you. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, I hope you've learnt something new and hope to see you again soon.